What up? Hey, everybody. Welcome to exam prep night. Hopefully everybody's uh, safe, locked indoors. Keep all the stuff worth looting inside of your house. All right. So uh, thank you all for coming uh, uh, to the uh, to the stream. Sorry we didn't do it last night, and I don't know, I can't remember, did we do it last week or not? I can't remember. So much going on, uh, but there we go. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, we're going to look at some code questions tonight. We'll dig into the fast tracks a little bit, and then we'll kind of look at some maybe uh, some competency review questions. Hold on for a second while I've got a threshold issue here. Test. Hold on for a second. Test. Hmm, I don't know. I don't know. I had a threshold issue there. So, okay. Anyway, thanks for coming. Hopefully you'll uh, get something out of it tonight uh, in the stream. And let me see real quick. Make sure this thing is, everything's going like it's supposed to. Yes. Okay. Good. So, Anyway, everybody's moving along pretty good in the in the in, the, in all their programs. Uh, those that are preparing for an exam that are in the program seem to be moving in along pretty good. Um, just got an an update. I will uh, um, be doing a um, a uh, electrician live show. Is going to be we're going to have special guest uh, Vince Delacroach, and he's going to be and we're going to have two special guests. Uh, not tonight, though, but they're going to be talking uh, the Siemens products, talking about their plug-on neutrals, and we'll have an in-depth discussion about surge protection devices. So that ought to be a pretty good episode. Again, I'm trying to figure out what in the world's with my threshold here. Hold on for a second. Okay. Not sure why that's doing that. Anyhow, so we're going to have a... A good electrician live coming up. I think that's going to be it's a June, June thirteenth uh, episode. I think that's a Saturday. So we still got to shoot some of the stuff, but uh, Vince will be live with me here. We're going to be shooting some uh, video for um, for Article Six Eighty dealing with swimming pools. That uh, should be interesting because both uh, Vince and myself serve on. Code making panel 17. So uh, he's new to that panel. I've been on there for a couple of cycles. So we're going to be doing some recordings uh, for that. And that'll be available after we do it. And obviously I have to do all the editing, but it'll be a series on uh, Article 680 that'll be available. Um, and that is, uh, sadly, that's only going to be available to the people that are in the membership. So again, if you want to get access to that series, you're going to have to be a uh, member of the uh, paid uh, membership. Sorry, it's based on 2020, so that's where we do all of our main 2020 stuff. So, uh, in the room, George. Again, hey George. Uh, let me know if you're in, when you're in Texas around this area. Let me know. It's a little more peaceful up here in McKinney. So, okay, I'll meet you down there, but you might stroll a little bit north, and you, you know, it's uh, less traffic and less crap going on. Um. Let's see here. Who else we got in the room? Tim, thanks for coming. Elwood, Eric, thank you. Uh, let's see here. Sandra, thank you. Gustavo, thanks for coming. Again, I hit my little thank you button for everybody. All right, so it's kind of we're going to get into to, to tonight talking about a little bit of some exam prep stuff. Um, Everything's starting to open up a little bit. The, the testing sites are back open. We have a bunch of students that have, that have tested recently. So uh, they are, uh, uh, were successful. And again, so around the country, most of the, the test centers start opening up, whether it's the uh, uh, PSI or, or whatnot, are, are going to start opening up. So that type of thing. So... Um, my advice to those that before I get started, my advice to those that are studying that are in the um, uh, Hector passed the exam today. That's what I'm talking about right there. Hold on, Hector. Let me let me get I didn't have my stuff geared up for you here. Hold on. 
Hector G. Passed his exam today. And what is beautiful about it is that Hector passed his exam and he's still in the chat tonight. That deserves another one. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. So, you know, I got to shave. What do y'all think? Take this off. Um, so, um, what was I talking about? See, I was so excited, Hector, about you know that I forgot what I was even going to talk about. Oh, the, the test centers are starting to open up. So for those that test that are in the program or studying in general, if you're within uh, two weeks or so, or you know, two or right at three weeks of your test date, this is time where you start really focusing, you know, when you're down to the last two weeks, that you start timing yourself a little bit. Use the app on your phone, set it for two minutes, uh, you know, and just put the timer on and push it and then try to answer the question before the two minutes. If you don't, that's fine. That's fine. But give you, you know, condition yourself to, to, to add what we call the this, this stress, a little bit of that stress. Up to this point, up, if you're preparing and you're, you're a month and a half away, two months away, whatever, like, no, time is not the essence at this point. You take your time and look through the questions and look at the answer, look at the questions, see where you could have used keywords to find the answer, it basically, just break the, that question all the way down in every which way but loose, okay? That's in reference to uh, Clint Eastwood, who just turned, what was it, 90? Hard to believe. I remember that movie. Anyway, so you want to make sure you break it down. So when you get down to the last about two weeks from exam, it's now time to put all your pieces together. It's time for you to get that calculator, that phone out. And again, like I say, uh, I do mine. Uh, when I'm doing tests or something like that, you know, how many of you got so many apps in your phone that you can't really even find everything in your phone? That okay. So in this case right here, uh, you can get a bunch of little apps for this, but I put in there two minutes. Okay, I just put two minutes in my phone. I have it sitting right there, and then I just click start. And it starts counting down. Okay. And you give yourself, you know, it's casual. You give yourself no app. It's built into your phone. It's just under your clock in your phone. So if you go into your clock feature in your phone, one of your apps for clock, you click it and it'll have timer, stopwatch, all that kind of stuff. So this is just built into the, this is just built into the phone. Um, you could use an egg timer if you want. You can, you know, one of those ones where you turn it at two minutes and it goes or whatever. Do whatever you want, however you want. But that, that's just a, that was just built into my phone and it gives you, you know, gets you used to about two minutes, uh, on a question. Okay. Uh, what is interesting is to do that a couple times and remember what I said, the first wave, you answer what you know, the second wave you answer what you marked, but you didn't know. Okay. And in this, on the first wave, you're going to, you're going to spend about a minute on it. If you spend more than a minute, then you stop it. Okay. Get yourself conditioned to it. Say, all right, I'm over, you know, I'm over a minute. I'm glancing at the clock and keep your eye on the clock when you're looking, because you're going to do that during the exam, because you're going to have a little clock running right up there in the top of your screen. Okay, so just get used to being very conscious of the timer so there's no surprise. Um, but again, as we normally say when it comes to preparing for an exam, three waves is the best way. And first wave, just go through and answer what you know. Uh, and through training, through classes, through uh, online, uh, through however you get your questions. And I, I'm not a believer in just uh, willy nilly and through the code book. Uh, I am, I'm not a believer in just taking this thing and then opening it up and trying to read it and memorize it or that type of thing. I am not. Uh, this is the, probably for many people, this is boring material. Not because we're electricians, it's neat to us, but I guarantee you if you sit in bed, you know, and you start studying this thing and you've had a hard day of work, you sitting there about 10 minutes into it, you'll be you'll be gone, okay? It's not the greatest read in the world. We have to learn it. 
Um, but, uh, you know, we don't have to learn to memorize it. We just have to learn how to navigate it. So at the end of the day, um, just go through the first ones, answer what you know. Uh, now, interesting thing about taking tests is they usually have ability to mark a question. So if you're going through the test and you are answering them, boom, 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 right? And then you get to one that you spend over a minute on. You look up at the clock and it's over, you know, it's a minute. And you're like, hmm, I still am no closer to getting this. Check, check mark it and go to the next one. Now, a lot of times you'll think, dude, I'm invested in this, man. I've got a minute in this bad boy. I ain't leaving. So then that's the, that's the death sentence to you. Because, you, you know, you start eating time. And the whole concept is to build you up enough time that you can focus on those. So the first wave, go through, answer what you know. Mark the ones that's going to take you more than a minute. And go on to the next one. Then you go back and you're going to answer the ones that you marked. Okay. So that's the, that's the concept. So the second wave, you go over those. And then, of course, third wave, you can save for any calculations. Now, if you have two separate exams like we have in Texas, then the three waves still works. All you're trying to do is, you know, is buy yourself time by answering what you know. Now, what's surprising is you might be surprised that as you get into it, even the ones that you go on the second wave, you'll answer in a minute because you'll be flipping through the code book a little bit. Okay, so even in that first wave, if I say answer what you know, you can still spend up to a minute on a question. Okay, but there's going to be a lot of them that you can just go, boop, and that's it. You're like, I know that one. Okay, just don't make foolish errors. Okay, don't make foolish errors. If they ask for KW, and you know, and then give it to them in KW. If they ask for it in VA, give it in VA. I'm sure they'll have all the answers there. Just make sure you read the question thoroughly. Okay? Important. Read the question thoroughly. Okay. Turn this off. The thing was vibrating like crazy. Um, so, that's, that's my advice for preparing. Now, in the last two weeks, pushing into three, like I said, that's where you're going to start timing yourself. But when you're just starting and you've got over, you know, you've got, over three weeks out, you got a month out, you got a month and a half out, two months out. Don't worry about speed right now. Worry about dissecting the question. That's the easiest way that I can say it. Dissect the question. Don't worry whether you get it right or wrong. Just use the answer when you get it wrong to help you look at all the possible ways that I could have found that answer. Uh, whether it's in X. And again, also, do not think that the index is going to be your holy grail. It is not. The index is not going to be the holy grail. Uh, this is not like a Tom Henry uh, uh, or a firm's index or whatever that's that thick and gives you every possible scenario. Nah, that's not what the index is all about. Okay, so it's great. It helps you get you somewhere, but it is not to be the holy grail. And so don't, my point with this is, don't get locked into it. Don't get it because you'll get really disappointed when you start not finding answers really quickly in the index and in your mind you start going, what the crap? I thought I was finding everything in this and that. What is this index for? And then you end up, you know what I mean? So we don't want you to get, it's not, we don't want to use the index as a crutch. There's nothing that's going to take the place. So if you're studying right now, I should be, you should be able to look at me. We have a conversation. I should be able to say, you don't have to know them all. But you should be able to know 240 overcurrent devices, 242 over voltage, 210 brand circuits. You should know 215 feeders, 225 outside brand circuit and feeders. Okay? You, you, you need to know these things. 100 definitions, 200 grounded conductors, 430 motors, 440 HVAC applications. You need to know, obviously, 250 grounding and bonding. You need to get used to it. You need to be able to, to, to understand that... A lot of this stuff, and you need to really also get used to some of the articles being pretty small so that you can recognize that, all right? Like 250, not small. 200, pretty small. You with me? So, I mean, you get used to knowing that in uh, 430 motors, not small, right? So you get kind of used to these different different things, you know? Um, I get to people, you know, elevators, 620. 
not so small, okay? Not so small, not so big, easy to manage. Uh, you definitely can manage it. But again, kind of taking those, keeping those concepts you really need. Now, I talk, used to preach all the time uh, about um, the issue with uh, flashcards. I am a big supporter of flashcards. Of course, in, in our program, we have uh, the, the Fast Tracks program, we actually have uh, the ability to make your own flashcards. And so I usually tell people that uh, you want to make a flashcard for every, um, every article, uh, every significant table, uh, and, and just about anything that you're, you're studying on, you can make a flashcard for electronically. Now, if you're going to do it physically, then I recommend you go down to the dollar store. You can, if you want to make them yourself, flashcards instead of, you know, online, if you don't, not in an online program, is get you some flashcards. They're cheap, like 500 in a pack. And you write on one side, Article 210, on the other side, branch circuits. And, you know, you can buy them, but why would you want to buy them? Because I prefer you to make them. Because the part of making it helps you learn it, right? Article 215, feeders, things like that. You're actually, you know, 300, okay? You're getting into it, wiring, 300 wiring methods, okay? 310 conductors. It just gets you used to it. And so that when you're in an exam, they just, you look at a question, you go, oh, that's an overcurrent protection device question. I'm going to be in 240. And so, again, it's just going to help you, okay? So that's why I recommend flashcards. Uh, again, if you're in the Fast Tracks program, then we've, we've, got a pro, we've got flashcards but, uh, built in, but you can make your own at any time um, in that program. Um, so let's go on and let's see here. Let me, let me acknowledge folks that are in here tonight just so I can do it. I think I got everybody down to uh, Joe, uh, John. Thanks for coming in. Wanna Fish, thank you. You're most welcome. Uh, Ramiro, thanks for coming as well. And of course, everybody in, I've already kind of said you, Tim, Hector, George, uh, Elwood, uh, Gustavo, uh, Sandra, all of y'all, thank y'all for coming. I think I got everybody. I got some folks over on the Facebook, uh, but they're not really chatty tonight, so I don't really have them saying anything, but hey, welcome for coming, that type of thing. Mandingos is in the building, is in the house. Whoop, whoop. Okay. All right. So let me see if I've got this thing queued up, guys, and I'm not sure I do, but we'll see. Uh, okay. There's my little my music that I play all the time. All right. So let's go into some questions. And you know what? We'll do some questions, uh, and then we'll shift over to do some uh some competency reviews. This is something I haven't shared with anybody before. We'll look at unit eight. Um, one of the tougher units for the students, uh, although I did a video for it in here. So folks that are in the fast tracks uh, see that I did a, uh, there's, you know, load calculation and here's a standard and here's the unit eight through 13. So I pretty much give the students the, how to work these questions out uh, in this example here. Uh, but, Again, and there's your flashcards and there's your reviews and all that kind of stuff. So there's your reading material and everything like that. So we'll, we'll kind of look at it a little bit tonight uh, for those out there that struggle with that one. But let's do, some, uh, let's do some questions. Let's just work some here. We'll go some down here that we haven't done. Let's see, percentage-wise of students. Let's look for one that's been pretty tough for guys. Uh, this one looks like they've given it a pretty good tough shot lately. Let me make sure that I'm on my screen here. Make sure I'm not blocking anything. And again, everybody says whether you can see the screen or not. Uh, let's see here if I can't do some adjusting here, folks. Just give me a second. I will. Uh, nope. Hold on. Uh, let's see here. I'm trying to do some adjustments for you. There we go. Hold on. I want to see if I can make these bigger. Because y'all don't need to do that. 
Bear with me here. Kind of crop these things up a little bit. And let's see here. And we'll just do this here on the right. We'll see what this does real quick, guys. Eh, that's not too awful bad. Hold on for a second. Bear with me. I'm, 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 I'm working it on the fly, guys. Keep aspect ratios. Okay, there we go. Good enough. It's a little bit bigger, a little bit better. Best I can do, guys. Okay. All right, so let's kind of look at some questions tonight. I'll help you out where I need to help you out. Hopefully you got your code books handy. Remember, you're trying to prepare for an exam. Nobody's going to hold your hand during the exam, so you're going to need to work these out. Doesn't do any good for me to know the answer. The problem is you need to know the answer. So the question is minimum spacing requirements between the bottom of a 600 volt rated switchboard and non-insulated bus bar mounted in a switchboard cabinet is blank. Okay. So let me get this uh, thing back up on the screen. Unit 13 is Tim. <laughs> yeah, Tim, it's your favorite. Uh, yeah, it's uh, 13 can be a beast. I got to ease people in, Tim. I can't, I can't throw them into the wolves that early. Okay, on that one, I got to, I got to, I got to ease people in for the, for that one. Um, so, all right. So, minimum space required between the bottom of a 600 volt rated switchboard and non insulated bus bar mounted in a switchboard cabinet is blank. Okay, so let's give you some time for you uh, folks to look this up in your code book, and then I'll help you where necessary. I'll get my code book as well. I don't have the electronic one geared up to run. So if we need to do it, I will do it. I will start it up, but I'm going to look them up just, just like you. Got my code book right here. I don't have my other camera on. So you don't need to see my other camera. I could turn it on, but let's see. Nah, you don't want to see two paws. Just me. Code book right here. Got it right here in front of me. Just like you. All right. So normally I, I'd hold your hand. But we're going to let you see if you can answer this question tonight. Again, the answer is A, B, C, or D. And see what you come up with. We will, we will talk about certain keywords that are in there, key terms. So that you can, if you need any help with that. So again, remember, what are we talking about? We're talking about minimum space, okay? And there's a certain term that puts us in a certain place in the code book. So this is a good example of learning the difference of, the, you know, different terminologies and where you would do something. I mean, obviously, this one is, is eaten up, eaten up with switchboard, Okay. I mean, it's pretty, pretty obvious, right? It's just, it's just eaten up with switchboard, okay? All right. So Tim is on the right track here. We, uh, what we're looking for is switchboards. Now, finding this in the code, again, if, if you're... You're used to the code and you know, hey, switchboards. And again, you would know this if you started making those flashcards because then you'll be like, wait a minute, 408, that's switchboard, switch gear, and pin boards. This is a great example that puts you right in. And I can tell you right now, I'm looking. 408, as much as, you know, check this out. As much as you study code and this code is thick as it is, it's kind of funny. This one is only four pages. I mean, really, it's only one loose page and in two other pages. I mean, it's 408 is not big at all. So, I mean, I guess I could have gone to the index. Let's just go to the index. I'll do it. Let's do it. And again, you know, y'all know y'all that come here often know why I'm doing it today, because y'all know that my PDF skills are terrible. Right. So, I mean, I can't read it. So I have to, I'm used to just using the code. So I'm going to be like you. Let's go and let's look up switchboard. And see what we got. I mean, that seems like that's predominant in here. Switchboards. So I'm going to look under switchboards and I see switchboards. And of course, in this there, it's talking about clearances. 
I noticed that and I remember that. Clearances, bus bars, all those type of things. So I'm going to look down here and I see clearances. Now, interesting enough, under clearances, I know we're not talking about a working space clearance. Because if I look under clearances, I see a 110.26. You'll just learn that, trust me. But even if you didn't, you could still write those three down, 110.26, 408.5, and 408.18. And you'd be okay, because right now, if you had to go to the index, because 408 is only four pages total, but you still had to, because you could have used bold scanning and probably find the answer quicker. But you have to put yourself in switchboards. And that's the question is asking about switchboards. So anyway, just to kind of peruse it, hopefully you follow along with me. I'm in the index and I'm looking down switchboards and I'm just looking down to see if there's anything else that might be beneficial. And I really don't see any, anything beneficial except for the clearances. So in my mind, I would have put myself and if I, I just know that it would have been 110.26. That's working space clearances. Okay. That's not what I want to be. But I do know that because of panel boards, switch boards, and switch gear, that I'm in 408. So this just confirms that I'm going to look at 408.5. But while I'm there, there is also a clearance recommendation for 408.18. I'm going to keep that. I'm going to write that down on my little scratch paper if you're in the exam because I don't want to come back here. Okay. Now, interesting enough, you don't see anything in here um, except for it says supporting bus bars, conductors, and that's 408.3. It's not what you're looking for, but... It still puts you in 408, okay? And that's what we need to figure out where we're going to be, okay? So let's go back. I'm going to go to 408.5 uh, because I know it's not 110.26. Ain't nobody asked me about no clearance. <coughs> Excuse me. And so I look at 408.5. It says clearance for conductors enter, entering a bus enclosure, okay? All right. Then it says where conduits or other raceway uh, enter a switchboard, switch gear. Floor standing panel board or similar enclosure at the bottom, kind of what we're talking about here at the bottom. Um, approved space shall be provided as permitted installation of conductors into the installation. The wiring space shall not be less than shown in table 408.5, where the conduit and raceways enter or leave the enclosure below, okay, below the bus bar. There are supports or other obstructions. So this says between the, it comes in minimum space between the bottom, okay, of the 600 volt switch, uh, switchboard and non insulated bus bars mounted in the switchboard cabinet, okay? Uh, so six, 10, eight, and 12. So interesting one about this one is that it sends you up to the table. The table's at the top right, and the top right says clearance from conductors entering the bus enclosure. And minimum space between the bottom of the enclosure. And there's supports or other obstructions uh, in the bus bar. So if it's insulated bus bars, there's support or other, it would be eight inches. But this is non-insulated bus bars. So you'll notice that it says 12 inches. Okay. And that was a lot for me to say when I knew right away that Tim had the answer. But I thought it was good to work ourselves through that because immediately if I'm on an exam, I'm thinking switchboard. But I want you to learn that switchboard, okay, is 408. That's what I want you to learn. And I want it to become just simply repetitious, okay? No simply, no different than my concealed carry training when I'm somewhere, if somebody were to come up to me and... I can pull that gun out and defend myself, okay? So I, without even thinking, habitual, just boom, boom, boom. All right. All right. Basic dude stuff. Okay. All right. Next question. Yes, I'm a Pat McNamara, whatever his name is, fan. I think he's a trope. All right. Next question. Dust off those code books. Blow them off, guys. Get the dust off of them. <laughs> Let's go. Next question. You ready? All right. In a farm building where livestock is housed and the 
echopotential plane system is required because the wire mesh or other conductive elements are embedded or placed under the concrete and bonded to metal structures that may become energized. The equipotential plane is necessary to prevent the minimum blank difference within the plane. Is it minimum current, minimum voltage, minimum wattage, or minimum resistance? Now, I can use a process of elimination to work this out because we're not talking about a floor heater. So one should be obviously not that. <laughs> and the other, we're not utilizing it for any, um, is a wire. So it shouldn't, there's two of these that should not, it should immediately be just be thrown out. So the next thing you really have only two real options here. Okay. But I'm gonna let you work this out. Now in here, you've got to understand what are we looking at? Because this is an example where you're thinking, okay, what's my keywords? What would I use? And again, remember the index is not going to save you everywhere. Okay. But one thing I will tell you is what do you think about when you think about livestock? What do you think about that? And when it comes to the national electrical code, it's a specific code article and it's not going to be livestock. Okay, so one way you could do it, I kill me, but that, you know, like somebody's probably going to say that, right? You, you, you could go to the index and I might go in and say, well, I'm interested in looking up the term livestock. Okay, well, let's do that. I'm not sure if you'll find anything under that. I can't imagine you would, but we'll go look. Why not? That's what we're here to do. We're here to look and learn. Yeah, I don't think there's any, anything to do with livestock back there. So that wasn't going to help you. But what is livestock? Okay. And so the next thing that people would say, well, Paul, the obvious here then has to be equipotential plane. Okay. Well, let's look under equipotential plane and just bear with me here. So I'm going to look under equipotential plane. See what we got. If there's anything under equipotential. You should be looking along with me if you're really truly studying. Okay. Now you'll notice that there is an echo potential plane, a word that just pokes out at you. Okay. What else would you need? Now, interesting enough, there's really uh, an echo potential application, uh, the echo potential in bonding requirements in 680.26 for pools, spas, hot tub, all that kind of stuff. Kind of same, kind of, kind of, kind of same concept, but a little different because that's about potentials. The issue with this with livestock, for example, cows and things like that, is if there's any potential current on it or any potential anything on it, they will not, um, if, there's, if there's not a voltage gradient, right, they will not produce. Okay. So, okay. So there is the difference. There, there could be at least two of these that are applicable to the concept, depending on what happens. But there is a, a defined application that you need to apply. So in here anyway, so echo potential, and I probably said two of them right in the same statement. Um, echo potential plane, it says 547.10 and 682.33. Well, as you learn, 682 is natural bodies of water. It ain't got a thing to do with livestock. So you'll learn that 547 is dealing with agricultural. Now, of course, in this case, you see that it's 547.10. So in this application, that's, I would already be done. All right. I did a lot of talking, but I would already be done. So I'm going to go, if you got tabs, use them. Uh, and usually there's not one on agricultural, but get you close enough and then use your tab. Now, agricultural, again, this is an example of what is it? One, what is this? One and a half pages at best. I mean, that's about it. Yeah, maybe, maybe one and a half. Maybe. Yeah, maybe about one and a half, one and a half. Yeah, one. If you look at it, to, to, if you take each page separately, then it's one, two, two and a half pages. Okay, two and a half pages. Okay, so if you're looking at now, 
dissecting it, you're looking for the equipotential plane statement in article uh, 547. So if I'm just kind of, then this is kind of do your scanning, right? And then we saw in the back that it said go to 10. So obviously that deals with something to do with the equipotential. So it says equipotential bond, uh, planes and bonding of equipotential planes. Uh, the requirement. Okay. Mm. Uh, let's see here. A lot of good information, but again, it's that uh, we're looking for specific values. So what I do when this is looking here, and I can just do the answer, but I want to find the actual statement. Okay. Show me stone. It's interesting. Huh. Maybe come, maybe come energized. You have to actually read down. So uh, let's see if it's in the explanation. Okay. So why are we doing What I wanted to point out is if you got your code books, look at informational note three. It is what it is, right? But You'll, you'll notice that it says low grounding electrode system resistance may reduce voltage differences in livestock facilities. So, oops, I can't do that one. Hold on, guys. Okay. So, if you look at back, so we're in, that got me to 10. Now, we knew it's voltage because I told you it was voltage gradients. But 10 did not give us the answer. We had to look at the informational note. But the explanation of equipotential plane is probably in definitions, which is a dot two. Okay, so if I go back and look at that. Now, this is a good example. If you already knew the answer, you just mark it. You knew it couldn't be wattage. You knew it couldn't be resistant. Okay, we weren't putting power into this, so we weren't talking about current. We knew it was voltage, and equipotential is voltage gradients and, and how we deal with that. But... In all fairness, let's look at uh, dot two, and you see equipotential plane, and you near here it says the blah blah blah. Keep on going. Minimize voltage differences uh, within the plane and between the planes. So it wasn't verbatim here, but you know that's what we're talking about. We're talking about voltages, okay? The the voltage gradients. And that's incidentally the same thing you're doing when you're dealing with, with pools, okay? Three foot perimeter. It's from the water to the perimeter out three feet uh, that you have to create where you, you, you don't have a large voltage uh, uh, differential, okay? Uh, that's where when you have a voltage differential, then that's where you can generate currents. And remember, the, the problem is the voltage doesn't get you, the currents would get you, but the voltage if you have voltage in a pool, it can cause you to go dis disoriented and it can cause you to drown. Most people don't get electrocuted in a pool, okay? Most people drowned in a pool and they drowned because uh, a certain amount of voltage gets on them and it messes with their equilibrium and then they, they, their muscles tighten up and they can't breathe and then they drowned, okay? We like to call it electrocution, but that's it's not really, okay? So... But at the end of the day, um, if you know the answer to this one, that is one of those you mark it, you go. But obviously, you know, again, once you're at, one, at 10, which is kind of the application of equipotential plane, just always remember that in some of them that are very unique to it, you want to make sure you check out the dot two as well because that's a definition. Now, remember, any other definition is probably going to be over in 100. Uh, and so... Uh, that one is, you know, we did have some changes in the 2020 when it comes to equipotential planes and where they're located and things go, but not in the 17. And we're looking at the 17 in case anybody asks. All right, next question. Make sure it's on the screen. Yes. Luminaires installed in fountains shall be protected by a ground fault circuit interrupter and operate at a voltage not to exceed blank between conductors. 250, 150, 25, or 120, okay? So, again, 
Understanding GFCI, there's, there's one, obviously, you're going to rule out right away. Uh, and if you really know some of them, then you're, you're going to rule out another one right away. But look this up. So we're talking luminaires. But remember, you, you, before you go diving in, you got your little flashcards, and you go diving into 410, you got to remember it's luminaires where? Fountains. Where would you go? Okay. Where would you go? What's up, Jay? Didn't see you in there. Thanks for coming. You got you to gotta, you gotta take some of that burden off of Tim's shoulders tonight. Okay? So, all right. So, fountains. But again, luminaires. So, if you didn't even remember, now, if you're studying the code, you know 680. You might not know which part, but you know 680. You can go and you can find out which one's dealing with fountains. You could go to the table of contents. If you know 680, then if you didn't know which part is fountain, you're trying to save yourself some time, then you could go to 680 in the front of the book real quickly. Look at it and say, oh, let me go down here and see which ones deal with fountains. And you can go down and say, oh, wait a minute. Fountains is part five. Okay. And what page is part five start on? It starts on page 553. So you can just go in here and jump to 553. Okay. Now, you probably could have gone to fountains in the back of the book. I did not because I know that fountains is very small, and I know that it's in 680, and again, it's, it's, it's all about your time. You know, when you're studying like this, don't stress the time, okay? But when, you're getting, when you get down to that last couple weeks, then you better start worrying about it. You'll start worrying about a little more time at that point, okay? So I'm going to go to part five in my code book for 680, And I know that that is what? Let's see, that's one. They even, you know, basically it's about one page if you take the two columns from, you know, front to back. Now, I'm just going in here and I would be looking at what triggers. What triggers would you have, guys? The triggers are the actual answers, which is the voltages. That's one trigger to be looking for. The other is any GFCI statement and luminaires and fountains. All of those need to be banging around in your head. You're going to have to get used to multitasking in your head. Think about it. GFCI, fountains, luminaires, the voltages, 150, 250, 240, and, and do that kind of thing. So when you get here, what I'm going to do is, is luminaires, and then you see, you'll see different things, ground fault circuit interrupters, okay, operating voltage, And you'll look and you'll keep on going and you'll look at it and you'll go, okay, I'm going to scan it. Now you probably could have gone to the back. Right? And let's see, hold on for a second. Why is my bear with me? Oh, there it goes. Sorry about that. I think it was jumping on me. All right, you go to it and you'll see, okay, the question is asking me about the voltage. So if you're looking at this operating voltage. It says, no luminaire shall be, and of course, we're 680.51b. It says, no luminaire shall be installed for operating a supply circuit over 150 volts between conductors, between conductors, period. And of course, then you have what's called submersible pumps, because that's something totally different. That's not luminaires, what we were dealing with. Uh, and then you go on, and then I always like to give a quick look anytime I'm in there to make sure, okay, now I'm totally out of luminaires now when I get to 680.52. So... You know, so my mind is, I'm thinking, okay, 150 volts between them. So I'm going to check that one. Correct, 680.51B. Okay. All right. And my extensions are not working tonight. All right. Very good. Daniel, you got it. Tim nailed it again. All right. Good deal. So next question. And then we'll, we'll kind of we'll, we'll work on some of those Unit 8 stuff. I won't keep you all too long tonight uh, for the exam prep. All right, question. Oh, and by the way, for those that are, that are interested, uh, we still have seats available for my June 20th um, grounding and bonding webinar. It's going to talk everything about grounding electrode conductors and grounding electrodes and the grounding electrode system. Going to cover a lot of information in, in three hours. It's going to be pretty packed. So again, uh, should be a really good uh, uh, webinar. All right. So next question is here on the screen. It says, "Where a buried ground ring encircles a building, because it does have to circle a building to be a ground ring, folks. Can't be halfway around. 
got to go all the way around. And circles of building is used as a grounding electrode. The NEC requires at least 20 feet of bare copper conductor, not smaller than two, four, three, or six. Okay. Great question. Very common on an exam uh, where they're trying to make sure that you know how to do these sizes. What's the trigger? For me, we're talking about grounding electrodes. What type? A specific type. So for me, I'm going to be digging into, you know, obviously you have 52, you have 50, that type of thing. Okay. So that's, uh, uh, yeah, Jay, the actual bundles went out this week. We have people that have ordered the bundle. Um, it's, it's, I had to do a special video on it because you literally have to register each program separately. And there's all five of the programs. What I don't tell people is, if I add any additional programs to it, people that are in the bundle get access to all them for free as well. So there's an electrical, I don't know if I should say this or not. There is another one that I'm adding here soon and it's electricity 101 course that we have and you will have access to that if you're in the bundle. And that is neat if you wanna learn about all different ways electricity works. I mean, the whole, it's based on the Delmar, it's a, it's a whole big thing on electricity, everything you want to know about electricity. So that's a course that you're going to have access to, too. But don't tell anybody because I haven't published that. I'm not making that known. Right now, we're five titles. <laughs> so don't tell anybody with that yet. All right. So, all right. So question. Okay. So we got some answers here. Brian's up in the hood. Hey, Brian, I didn't see you in there. Thank you for coming in. I didn't see you in there. Ooh, Daniel's already cranking them out. Jugsters in there. Okay. Hey, no problem. I'm glad. I'm glad you get something out of my videos. Hopefully, uh, you get something out of it. Trust me, I got my own share of haters out there. So, you know, those that do get something out of it, I appreciate it. I'm I'm not like your normal educator. So, hopefully, you enjoy it. So, anyway, let me get a drink. We'll let you get a couple more answers in there because you should be looking this up. So. One of the things um, in this is we know that it's a grounding electrode. We know that it's going to be in 250. We should know that. Uh, we can go to the back of the book and look under ground rings. I'm sure that's something in there. Uh, we can look under grounding electrode. Those are key triggers. Okay. So my hope is that over time that you learn to be able to answer this one right away, because this is one of those ones that you'll get right away, um, especially after you tip up like, I, like my uh, grounding and bonding course, okay? Mm. Let's see here. Dude, Brian, dude. Dude, I just noticed that. I just noticed that, dude, congratulations. I'm excited. I get more excited for everybody. It, it's been 20, 30 years since I passed my exam. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, people passing exams. That's what I'm talking about. Taking their game to the next level. Uh, you know, that's awesome. And, and for those that are way younger than me that do this, it's always awesome to see because, you know, I'm going to die. And we need the next generation of people that can, accurately and this is important accurately teach other people explain things to other people lift themselves up in the trade and really take pride you know i, I get a lot of time I, I listen i will admit i listen to some podcasts every now and then and people have their shows and they're they're banting back and forth and they're dissing the code or they're dissing this and look i understand sometimes you got to do what you got to do i get it i am not just one of those code guys that say oh everything's exactly the code you still got to learn the code. Then you get to put that on top of your, your skills that you have. It's, I don't know why people, some electricians out there, you know what I'm talking about. You talk to them in a forum or you talk to them somewhere and they bash the code or they, you know, and you think about it and you go, why don't you just learn it? Maybe you're hiding something. Maybe they're hiding something. Okay. I'm just saying, maybe. Okay. I was going to, no, I'm not going to go there. I was going to go 
about current events. But I'm not going to go there. I'm going to take the high road and go different. All right. So anyway, congratulations, Brian. Congratulations. Uh, I thought I saw some there. Gregory tests in the morning. All right, Gregory. Yeah, positive thoughts. Focus on what we said. Multiple waves. Really focus. Get it in there, and you'll get it. You'll get it. All right. Uh, Brian, I will say, I think you still have a unit or two left. I, w- I will expect you to finish your units in your Fast Tracks program, sir. <laughs> I will expect you to finish what you started, sir. Okay. Anyway, next question. All right, I've left you enough time to answer this question. So uh, we could go to the back of the book, but you should know that if you're doing this, you want to go to the grounding electrodes uh, and inside of a five, uh, 250. And so we would be in 250.52, okay? So I'm going to go to 250.52 rather than the index. Again, there's a bunch of ways I can get there in the index, okay? I can get there by looking up ground rings, probably grounding electrodes. Uh, but again, over time, you realize, remember, grounding electrodes are in 250.50. Anywhere around there after that, 250.64, 250.66, all of those are going to be either dealing with sizing or of the electrodes or the grounding electrode conductors. So they're all right there tight in the same place. So if you get questions and it's asking you to size the grounding electrode conductor, you should be right there around 250.66. If you um, are talking about the different electrodes, then you know you should be right there around 252 in that area. So I teach people compartmentalize the different areas in the code that the most Uh, chances are you're going to spend your most time in, okay? 250.66, 250.64, 250.52, and other than 250.102C1, those are where you're going to spend most of your time, believe it or not, okay? So anyway, let's go to 250.52. I'll give you enough time. And you got your tabs. And 250.52. All right. So I'm at 250.52. I think I'm at it. Sun, so my lights, you know, my studio lights, I don't usually have this great shiny complexion, okay? It's because I got three big LED lights on here, and they're not supposed to be hot, but they're freaking hot. All right, so 250.52, grounding electrodes. What are we dealing with? Ground ring. We simply, boom, 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 you skip down. What do you see? Ground ring. Hmm, 250.52, looks like it's A4. It says, a ground ring encircling... The building or structure in direct contact with the earth consisting of at least 20 feet of bare copper conductor, not smaller than 2AWG. Absolutely. Everybody that said that got it absolutely right. Now, remember, an engineer could make it larger. Once you get in the real world, if they make it 4 ot, you can grin a little bit and look at them and shake your head and go, really? Really? Because it's not their money it's coming out of the pocket is. And, of course, you could say it's not yours, but... You're probably going to do what the engineer says. The next person's not, and he bit it using a two, and this engineer wants you to put a four out, and you're going, that's crazy. I ain't put no four out in the ground. But if that's what's on the drawings, that's what you're going to do. Uh, unless you are, and, and this is how I used to be, I would push back. I would say, dude, do you know why you're even making it be four out? Do you have any idea? Because the code says it doesn't have to be larger than a two. What are you doing? You know, and then maybe they'll change it. And then there you go. And then you only have to run it. Okay. All right. So again, if you're a standoffish kind of guy. Okay. So there you go. 250.52A4. Beautiful. Uh, We'll do one more here and then we'll go look at, uh, actually we have, we only have four more. So let's kind of knock these out real quick. For either overhead or underground primary distribution systems exceeding 1000 volts on private property. The service disconnect you mean shall be blank. A, in a location that is readily accessible. B, in a location that is readily accessible to qualified persons only. C, no closer than five feet from the structure or building and no further than 20 feet from the structure or building. Or D, permitted to be located in the location that is not readily accessible. So, a couple things. Exceeds 1,000 volts, private property. Service disconnection means. We're talking about 
where the service disconnection means it's to be located. Okay, so look at that one. Give itself a little bit of time and see what you think. Not a bad question. I, I don't know how often somebody would get this. You know, this one might not, you know, I guess it could appear on exam. Anything's possible. Okay. So, again, now we're talking about the service disconnecting means now. Okay. So keep, keep those things in mind when you're looking at it. Ah. Sorry about that. This, this, these, uh, these things right here are driving me crazy. All right. I'm looking like you. I want to find the answer too. Okay. Oops. Sorry about that. Y'all answering this question? I will. Hold on. Let me. Nobody. Okay. What do you think? What do you think? Maybe not the easiest one to find. What would be your triggers? Hey, Terrell, you could have just said A, B, C, or D. <laughs> That's a lot of typing. That's a lot of typing right there. Have y'all noticed that we haven't gotten anything, any of those comments where, uh, where it came on and said double typing or, or, you know, remember how the thing used to jump on everybody? We haven't gotten that in a while. Notice, have you noticed that? We haven't gotten any of those. So, <laughs> but um, you just probably, Terrell, you're probably just a, a super fast, super fast typer, right? So, okay. All right. So first thing is we know that we're dealing with a service. And the one thing that makes us feel better with this is we know in 230, for example, it talks about services. It talks about service disconnects. I mean, some people's mind might have jumped up into, you know, into uh, they're thinking, well, I'm going to be up in 240. That's overcurrent protected devices, which could be associated with a disconnect. But where are we at? We're talking about the disconnect, service disconnection means, and we're talking about for a system that exceeds 1,000 volts. So... One way to do this would have been to go, you know, you're in 230. If you identify you're dealing with a service, um, then because it says service disconnection means, so like, it's like, hey, hey, you could have gone to the contents and look and see under 230, which part deals with the over exceeding uh, over a thousand volts. You could have done that and that would have locked you in on certain location, right? Um, if you went into the back of the book, and I, and I didn't because I kind of knew where this was, but um, I don't know. Let's see here. Um, over 1,000 volts. I would look under over 1,000 volts. We, we've learned that that is something in the code. And while we're doing this, Terrell, share with everybody what you did to find it. And I'll look here in the over. I did it. I would have done it by going to 230 and then knowing I was dealing in services and disconnects. And I would look and I know that the trigger for me is exceeding a thousand volts. That's how I would have do it. But again, there's many ways to do it. Uh, but I want to see if there's anything in the back of the book that might help you guys. We have over 600. Um, and let's see here. Over a thousand. Okay, we have over a thousand. And then I'm just kind of looking down and see what we've got here in my offerings. <laughs> Service equipment, eh. But that's not, that's not what we're looking where we want to be. And let's see here, it's still service equipment, it's what we're dealing with, so we want to keep on going down. And then I get to services. 
And okay, so service is 230, but then it tells us that we're in part, what is that, 678? That's part eight. And just for checking, yes, that matches. So I would have gone there and I would have hit the bolt and I would have seen what I'm dealing with and I would have seen location. And then of course, okay. So that's how I would have gotten it. That's one way to do it there. So over a thousand volts, it's, it's in the code. So for those that went that direction, perfect. You're, you're fine. Um, what's next? Service disconnect. Could, let's see. Could I have gone to service disconnect in the back of the book? And let's see here. And this is why I tell you to do this. Because you start to learn. You'll remember. You'll say, oh, yeah, there was an over 1,000 volt. Because I worked one of those exam questions. And there is it. So my question's over 1,000. I'm going there. That's why we do this. Okay? That's why I walk you through this. It's very e let me let me explain something to you. It's very easy for somebody to prepare and put slides together and teach you than it is to bring things up on the screen and just work it on the fly. Okay? You can have people that are going to look like they're superstars and they're the God's gift to whatever when it's pre-planned. When it ain't pre-planned, you're working it out like everybody else because I am just like you. Okay? I'm just an electrician. So we're going to look it up. And when I say just electrician, I say that with the fact that that's the utmost pride. Not just electrician. We are the masters of voltage. The keepers of the current. The gods of lightning. Okay, enough of that. Anyways, <laughs> I was losing all of the ones that I could use. So sorry, I was... <laughs> Uh, all right, so again, so I'm looking at you know, service equipment over 1,000 volts. Service equipment, scroll down, it says over 1,000 volts, 230.205. Look at that. That's another way to get there. Beautiful. Beautiful. We got three ways that we could have found that answer, but we hadn't said what the answer is yet. Hey, Brian. Oh, you had that very, they had a very similar question. There you go, folks. These questions are very similar to what's going to be on your exam. Okay? Can't say that. Can't say that for the ones that you just get off the internet. Okay? Very similar. Thank you, Brian. All right. So if I'm at 230.205 location, it says, oh, it says for either overhead or underground primary distribution systems on private property. Wow, that looks familiar. It says the service disconnect shall be permitted to be located in a location that is not readily accessible. Okay. So, so permitted to be in a location that is not readily accessible. Sure does seem like that's the one to me. Uh, but I'm going to read a little more just so I don't make a boo-boo during the exam. Nope. Looks like it's right. So there you go, 230.205A. Beautiful question, beautiful way we work that out. Beautiful way to see that there's other ways that you, so when you, this is a prime example when I tell you folks to dissect the question. Take your time, that's why I say, up until you get to the last three weeks where you can then start doing, or two weeks you can do some timing, don't be in a hurry, don't get discouraged. What you wanna do is look at a question, answer it, Every possible way you can answer it. Use the index to look up all of keywords because you'll get used to it, right? You'll get used to seeing things, and that's why we do it. There's a reason why the Fast Tracks program has 20 practice exams in there. And I guarantee you, Brian and, and Tim and, and, and everybody in there, you know, Jay, I, I guarantee you they didn't answer, they didn't do all of those practice exams, okay? guarantee you but you do enough of the competency stuff you do enough of this stuff you just you can't help but get more fluid in the code i had a guy ask me today he says i'm looking for a weekend crash course and i'm like have you studied he goes no i'm like so what he said i found one uh and it's uh 450 bucks i'm like really are you going to take the are you taking it on Monday? Because I guarantee you, if you ain't studied and you go try to cram on a Friday, uh, Saturday and Sunday, you ain't going to pass it on Monday. No, it's not how it works. Certainly not how it works with the code. And then are you just trying to pass the exam 
or are you really trying to earn? I know, I know there's some people out there that'll say, look, Paul, I'm just trying to get the license. That's it. I get you. But I can't do that. I have to teach you something in the process. I just can't. I can't teach you shortcuts. I've got to teach you the code. Okay. All right. We're getting near to the end of these. Ready? Answer this one. We'll move a little quicker here. Given a rigid metal conduit, iron C, contains only the following three circuits on the load side of the service overcurrent protective protection device. Okay. I've got 250 ampere three phase circuits. I got one 300 ampere single phase circuits. The load side equipment bonding jumper for this conduit must be a minimum size blank copper. Okay. So think about here now what we're saying. We're talking about load side. Okay. Load side. And it says, again, read the question carefully. Rigid metal conduit contains only the following three circuits on the load side of the service overcurrent protective devices. We have two 150 amp here, three phase circuits, and we have one 300 amp here, okay? Single phase circuits. The load side equipment bonding jumper for this conduit must be minimum size what? Okay. We have a rigid metal conduit, just one. These are in it, okay? So we need a equipment bonding jumper. What do you do? Where do you go? What are you dealing with with an equipment bonding jumper? Let's see what we get. It's a good question. It's actually a very good question. Kind of poorly worded, but a good question, okay? Give you a little bit of little time to think this one over. I'm going to go as well, and then we'll, we'll, we'll dissect it. Don't worry. But I'm going to go where I think the answer would be. And again, again, I apologize for not shooting the code book onto the screen tonight. Uh, because I would just be flipping, 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 and, you know, that type of thing. And, and I, be honest with you, I'm having more and more trouble seeing. So I think I have a prescription that I've got to get updated. <laughs> Okay, uh, but there is a specifically somewhere that you need to go. Okay. What do you think? What do y'all think? Again, you've got 250 ampere three phase circuits. And you got one 300 ampere single phase circuits. Yes, they can be in the same raceway. If that was your next question. It's all about the voltage. As long as the, again, it's service conductors that can't be in the same raceway as feeders and brand circuits. Yes, you can have the uh, three phase and single phase in the same raceway. That is not a problem. Okay. That is not an issue for those that want to ask that question. That is not an issue. Okay. So I'll give you folks a little more time. And I'm going to look and verify real quick. Yep. Okay. Let's see what we got, what you guys got. And then we'll show you how we figured it out. It's hot in this room. I'm giving you guys some time. Let's let me look over at my Facebook guys. Hey, Randy, what's up? I didn't see you in there. Um, it's okay. Randy, it's okay. Next time, this is kind of what we do. Uh, it's a little different every now and then, but, you know, we look up questions on this Wednesday night. And some nights I do a presentation where I'll go over calculations or I'll go over something. And then some nights we just do code lookup and I let you look it up, give you a chance to use your code book and look things up. And then we'll dissect the question and, and break it all down. Um, kind of anything that gives you the confidence to make sure that you nail that exam. So, you know, go look at previous ones that I've recorded because we've done a bunch of different things and calculations and everything. So we just kind of mix it up every now and then. Okay. 
So we've got uh, Tim says, you know, says, uh, remember, this is this is all in one raceway. Okay. So how do we get there? Okay, again, I'm just trying to remind. Remember, all in one raceway. Think that over. Think that one over again, Tim, and let's look at it and see. Now, remember, key things here. It's on the load side. Okay. So it's on the load side. And interesting enough, I think we've we got some answers here. Let me go on and let me go on and do this. Okay, so Tim, the reason it's not one is because you're not adding these up. The real issue here is it's it's if you go to the first thing that I would have done is I go to 250.102D. Now 250.102D is equipment bonding jumper on the load side of an overcurrent device, and it says the equipment bonding jumper on the load side of an overcurrent device shall be sized in accordance with 250.122. Okay, so. And that, that type of thing. Now, it says a single common continuous equipment bonding jumper shall be permitted to connect two or more raceways or cables if the bonding jumper is sized in accordance with 250.122 for the largest overcurrent device supplying circuits therein. Okay? So, in this case, I have 250 ampere circuits. Which, again, we know that the circuit has to be protected at its rating. So, again, 150 amp devices, and we have one 300. Okay. So, just like an equipment granting conductor, just think of it this way. I can have a raceway, and I can put any number of circuits in there. I could have a 15 amp circuit, 20 amp circuit, 30 amp circuit, and a 50 amp circuit, provided it fits in the raceway, and we don't have all this adjustment and corrections and all this kind of stuff. I only have to size the equipment ground conductor for the largest of all of the devices for the circuits that are in that raceway. So the, if I size the equipment ground for the 50, then I'm good for all the other ones. Same concept here. If I size it for the largest for that raceway, because it is on the load side of a, of a device, or the load side of a service, a, disc, uh, a service overcurrent protected device, then I only have to size it based on the largest overcurrent protective device. So 250.102D is going to send me to 250.122. And then I'm looking here for the 300. That tells me it's a four copper. Always assume copper unless stated otherwise. And of course, this does say copper here. So that's why it would be a four. Okay. So you started here. You ended up moving your way through it. Okay. Now, interesting. You notice here it says, and I don't need this, but just for you know edification, if you look at it, you'll see that um, the, where we get the rule that allows us to do this, and, and unless you just know to do it, is 250.122C. If you look at it, it says multiple circuits. It says where the single equipment grounding conductor is run in multiple circuits. And again, this is an equipment bonding jumper, but because we're referenced back to 250.122, it's germane because of how it's referenced back for the equipment bonding jumper and how you size it. And it says... Again, where the single equipment granite conductor is run with multiple circuits in the same raceway, and that was a key, one raceway, um, it says it shall be sized to the largest overcurrent protective protecting conductors in the raceway cable or cable tray. Okay? So that's how we got that one. That make more sense now? Okay? Yep. So um, that is why, you know, you see this run all the time and... and, and you don't, you know, typically it's a design thing. So I wouldn't have a raceway and I'm going to put all these circuits in there and I'm going to run a separate equipment ground for all of them. No, I'm going to run one equipment ground size to the largest possible overcurrent device. Then when I get to the junction box, have you ever heard of those home run cables where you have a bunch of different circuits in it? Well, there's one equipment ground in there, for example, and it's sized based on the largest overcurrent device. Once it gets to the actual junction point where it's going to branch off into the other circuits, then you would take an equipment ground to the, with those circuits because it's separating it away. You're just going to splice them in the box, but you only need the one inside the raceway. Okay.
you know, of course, if you have separate raceways, and you're going to have separate ones on each raceway, that type of thing. But that's just uh, a good exam question. And remember that anytime it says equipment bonding jumper or equipment ground igniter, as long as it's on the load side and you get something like this, remember you're looking for the devices. Okay. It's a good question. Next. When, inception, when exceptions are not applicable, means you don't worry about any exceptions here. It says, and a common grounding electrical conductor is used for multiple separately derived systems. Okay, multiple separately derived systems. Uh, this could be, for example, a three-story building with a transformer on every floor. Okay, one on every floor. Could be that. It says the minimum size common copper grounding electrical conductor tap for a separately derived alternating current electrical system with three parallel sets of size 300 KC mil copper secondary conductors shall be blank. Okay. Give this one a try. Now notice it says the minimum size. Okay. So give, give that one a look. And again, I don't know that one like this would be on an exam, but I mean, hey, this is, it's, it's complicated enough that it, it, that it could be on an exam. They're not trying to trick you. That's certainly not trying to trick you, but there's a lot of info here, say. But so the one thing that we're thinking about, now, I don't want to give, it, give away any of it, but again, there's certain things that you need to, to look at first. In the code, again, we're talking, we are talking about multiple separately drive systems, okay? Okay, so no, that does not mean that you go jumping up into transformers or you jumping up. No, don't go there. Didn't want anybody to whoosh, head right that way. They're like, dude, I'm gone. Don't go there, okay? So we're dealing with the application here of this. So kind of give it your some thought where you need to be and the key thing here does have a lot to do with these separate drive systems now is don't get me wrong a lot to do with it but you're going to have to you're going to have to think about this one a little bit okay i'll give you a couple of seconds this is not this is one that really if you're studying for an exam uh, this is one you want to take your time on here. Now, one of the key things here is the reference to the term minimum size or the concept of minimum size. Okay, so give it some thought. And just remember what we're talking about. We're not talking about the grounding electro system technically to a dwelling and things like that. We're talking about for the separately derived system. Okay. That type of thing. Now we can work this one to work this one together, but there's some stuff in here that's, that's thrown in here simply to confuse you. Okay. Because it's definitely wanting the minimum size. So we'll work. We can, we definitely will work through this one. And I have where I want to be. And we'll see what everybody else says. Eyeball. I have a question about solar. You have a moment. I, eyeball. Who's eyeball? I don't want to get into a, I don't, right now I'm trying to do some exam prep, Ryan. I don't want to get into a deep answering somebody's question about solar yet. Um, I'll give you some time at the end, but when I get into answering people's code questions and it's not exam prep, it tends to eat up a lot of time. So I want to focus on exam prep and, and then I'll, you know, I'll answer your question if I, you know, if I have time to do that type of thing. I do encourage people with their questions to email me your questions um, because a lot of times, you, you know, I can't get in your head 
and you might be writing something and you want me to answer a question and you're doing it on a quick typing, I can't picture what you're picturing. And so you get all frustrated. Uh, it's so much easier if you can explain it out in an email and ask me a question. Now, if it's exam questions, different. But if you're asking me something of an opinion, you can imagine I get very lengthy stuff sent to me. Uh, but I want to make sure that, you know, I have all the information. I, nothing that ticks me off more is answering questions when I'm only getting half pieces of a question. Okay. And I do that as a consultant all the time. And I, you know, I, it, and that's usually when I'm getting paid and I'm like, dude, you got to give me all the info, all the info. Then I can't answer the question without all the info. It's just not fair uh, to do that, but I'll do my best, but let's, let me try to finish on this. So yeah, when I, we get some time uh, and we'll do that. Um, or load your question up and type it and, and just have it ready. Um, so, okay. So anybody else? Oh, my email address is info, I-N-F-O, I-N-F-O, at masterthenec.com. Tim or something, somebody wants to type that in there or whatever, but that it's info, like information, info at masterthenec.com. That would be my info. It's not as easy for me to type it on the screen, so. Maybe I'll, I'm going to create a quick link that I can push a button and post my contact information in the future. I'll, I'll do that, you know, just like I do for this. And just like I do for this. Okay. All right. So the question here. So interesting question. I'm not seeing a bunch of answers here. I did get one answer, but it's not correct answer. So I'll look at it. So it, one of the things here is to say, okay, none of the exceptions apply. We know that it says when exceptions are not applicable. So we're not applying any exceptions or any of that kind of stuff. It's wanting to know. Okay, it says it wants to know a common grounding electric conductor is used in multiple separate drive systems. That's key. The minimum size common copper grounding electric conductor a tap uh, for a uh, separate drive alternating current system with three parallel sets of size 300 kc mil. Okay. All right. Now, if you look in this application, uh, let's see here. Yeah, I want to make sure it doesn't, I don't want to use that exception. Yeah, one, one, two, okay. So everybody hasn't and it found it. So the first thing that I'll tell you to look is that you probably need to look at, well, let's, well, we're going to answer, but we've got three sets, okay? Three sets of 300 KC mil, okay? So if you go in your code books, folks, Two, let me see what's the reference. I got to go all the way back here. My eyes ain't as nearly as good as they used to be. 250.30A6. So 250.30A6, you'll see that we're talking grounding electroconductors, multiple separately derived systems. Now it says common ground electric conductor is used for multi, you know, again, we're talking about the minimum size common uh, common grounding electric conductor taps. Okay. So if you look down, you read it, you kind of, kind of go down. You'll see there, it says for common grounding electroconductors, it says a common grounding electroconductor shall be permitted to be one of the following. Number one, it says a conductor of the wire type, not smaller than three aught copper, 250 aluminum. Two says a metal water pipe complies with 650.68C1. Not, not really in our, what we're dealing with. And you'll notice that that's an A and then there's a B. But anyway, read the next one. It says a metal structural frame of a building or structure that contains blah, 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 blah. Not really applied. So look at B. It says tap conductor size. It says each tap conductor, okay, each tap conductor shall be sized in accordance with 250.66 based on the derived ungrounded conductors of the separately derived system it serves, okay? 
So in this case, we're looking at separately drive system, three parallel sets. Um, the first part of me would have said maybe three ought, right? Thinking. So maybe, oh, wait a minute, I got that we haven't done it yet. So, you know what? Maybe Sandra nailed this one. I don't know. We have to work it out. So then I'm going to go to 250.66. And I'm going to do and what, we, what we said. We had 300, so 36, so it's 900. So it looks to me, what did Sandra say? Hold on, I might so Sandra, an apology. <gasps> Hold on. Let's do this real quick. Oops, wrong screen. Oh! <laughs> Hold on, hold on. Okay, this is one, this is a good one to, to explain this. Let me, let me talk to you here. So there's a difference between the grounding electroconductor, the common grounding electroconductor that runs all the way up the stem. And then from that common grounding electroconductor, you have taps. Okay, you have taps that, that, that come off of it. All right, so A1, uh, a1 is talking about conductor. That is for the, uh, to me, I don't like the question. That's why I'm kind of li linger out there. And I, I just, I think I said, Sandra, I think I said you're wrong in the beginning, but I didn't want to, I thought I was being mean and I didn't want to do that right up front because I wanted a little more time. This question is written, not the greatest, but it is indicative of what you might see on exam. Break this down. It says the common ground electric conductor is used in multiple separately drive system. The minimum size common, okay, common copper grounding electric conductor tap for a separately drive alternating current system with three parallel sets of 300 uh, secondary conductors shall be, okay. In this one, I disagree with the author because of when he said, electro, uh, I'm talking about the taps. So if you look at B, it's talking about the tap conductor size. Each tap conductor, that's a tap from the common over to, okay, the separately derived system. If I saw that in a question, that's what I would think that he'd be thinking about, okay? And since there was two plausible answers here, this is an example where I would contest this question. But again, you wouldn't know it if you didn't get it wrong or not. Um, I'm going to give you some advice most, I would say 90% of the exams that you get will ask you a question like this, but they want to know the size of the, the minimum size common grinding electroconductor. Okay. That's what they're really wanting to know. And so if that's the case, it would be three out copper or 250 aluminum. Okay. So, and sadly to say this question does appear in the the latest fast tracks, the 2020 as well. So I'm, I'm a little discouraged. Uh, I could, I would have written the question just a slightly bit better. Um, but again, I didn't want to, I didn't want to dash your spirits, you know, Sandra, right there on the first one there, <laughs> because you probably were thinking the same thing that most people would think, you know what I'm saying? Probably thinking the exact same thing. So again, that question is one of those where you're like, eh, Eh, maybe, but I don't like the words. Take out that tap, and I know I have no question what size it has to be. All right, next question. We're getting to the end of these, folks. Continuous duty motor. And wait a minute, while y'all are looking, okay, I'll read it to you. Continuous duty motor rated more than one horsepower with a marked service factor not less than 1.15 shall have a maximum running overload protection sized at blank of the nameplate rating of the motor, assuming that the motor will start and run. Okay, so we're assuming the motor will start and run. There's no problem with it starting and running. It's a continuous duty motor, which is not to be confused with continuous load. But again, they still are going to equate to about the same thing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So again, where do we go for this? We did a motors class probably a month, two, whatever ago. So for those that are, that are into the motors, know where you need to be. Oops, sorry about that. Oops, I don't know what I just did. They're both Those that know where the motors are probably have a good 
idea of how they're answering this one. But what's the question asking me about? Overload. Overload, overload, overload. But again, remember, everything else with a motor that deals with most everything is dealing with what? Since it said nameplate rating in here and it's dealing with the overloads, then we know it's where we're going in 430 for overloads. You should, you should by now though, when you work, if you're working motors, if you haven't watched my video on motors, you need to go watch my video on motors. Um, we're not doing anything that would deal anything with needing the FLC. Don't need it for this one. We've got enough information here to, to answer this question. Okay. So let's see what y'all get. Ah, Sandra's throwing up in there. Um, I'm thinking Sandra means 125% because that's actually 1.25%, but you know what I'm doing. You know, I know what you mean, Sandra. I know what you mean. All right. So Tim says A. Okay. All right. So one of the things that I do on motors is what are we sizing for? We're sizing the overload, right? So, a couple things you could do. You know it's a motor. It's a no common sense. It said continuous duty motor, so you get that. You could go to the beginning of 430, right? And 4030 has the pictograms. And, of course, if you remember, those that can write in your code books, I should show you, those that can write in your code books a couple, a while back. Oh, let me see it. There, you see some little marks. I actually put the different code sections next to the different segments. Again, if you can't mark in your code book, you can't do it. Texas, you can, but uh, if you can't, you can't. Um, but you get used to, but you got all of them here anyway, the parts anyway. So if I was dealing with this, um, and remember, Jeff, we're, we're not sizing conductors, bruh. We're sizing overloads. It says the maximum running overload protection. Okay, so... Now, again, it says it assumes that it's going to start and run with no problem. It made that statement. Okay. So if I look in here and I'm looking in the front of 430, I'm looking for overloads. Uh, protection overloads, part three. Ah, part three. So I'm in 430. I'm going to go to part three. And let's see here. Half the time, you got to be perusing all of the bolds in order to make sure you hit it right. Part three. Part three is motors and brand circuit overload protection. Skipping the bolds, I get down. And you have continuous duty motors. Okay. Uh, it's got to be on there, Caleb. I've got a bunch of members. Quite a few of them are in the room here. It's a join button. You click join. It's not the it doesn't say membership. It says join. Um. So we'll go look at it for all those that want to join our membership thing. Um, anyway, so 430.32, continuous duty motor. That's what we're dealing with. And then it's talking about a separate overload. Okay, so here it's simply talking about an overload. So we can center it separate. It's not talking about it being integrated in anything. And, uh, and then you go down and you go, okay, well, it says, what does it say? It says a separate overload device that is responsible for overcurrent. The device shall be selected to trip on uh, or trip or shall be rated no more than the following percentage of the motor. And remember, it says no more than the following percentage of the, of the motor's nameplate full load current rating, which is kind of a funky way to say it. We have an FLC, which is full load current. I wish that they would change this to full load amp rating, but... You're just supposed to learn that FLC is for sizing conductors. It's for sizing short circuit ground fault protection, feeder short circuit ground fault protection, conductor sizing, all that stuff's based on FLC. There's only a few times that the nameplate is used, and that is for overloads and for specialty motors under 430.22E, okay? And that is for things like elevator motors and things like that. So... Most of the time on your exam, it's just going to be straightforward. They're not going to bring up 430.22E, which is a unique other way to use the nameplate. Most 99.9% .9 of the time when they talk nameplate, they're, they're trying to find the overload size. 
All right, so in this case, it says motors with the Mark Service Factor 115 or greater uses 115%, uh, 125%, excuse me. Uh, motors with a marked temperature rating of 40 degrees C or less use 125%, and it says all other motors. So let's kind of look at this one more time. It is a one horsepower motor. Okay, whatever. It is uh, with a service mark fetter not less than 115. Okay. So it's not less than 115. Shall have a maximum rating. So it's not less than. So it's if it's not less than 115, then it's 115. I, would, I guess how uh, they would say it. All right. So there's a table. And again, important is, and we'll go and answer this, but then I'll explain to you. So uh, this one here is the answer. But a couple things to remember on an exam. It said maximum, right? But it made a statement that the motor and runs and starts. If it makes a statement that the motor won't run and start, then you get to jump over into the C on the, you know, just on the other column. And that is 430.32 C. And that's where you start to see you can have the 140s and the 130s. Okay. Here they, because the only way you can get there is if it won't start, if it won't run. Okay. If it trips. Okay. Then if it does, then you're allowed to go to a, a higher percentage for your overload. And so you start out with the minimums. And I usually tell students, you write the, even though the word is maximum, that's for the question. I put minimum, I write minimum next to the table at the top left. And then I write maximum on, next to the table on the on the C, on the right side of the page. Uh, not to have anything to do with the maximum statement here. It's like, that's the maximum it can be. If it runs fine, starts fine, this is what you use. If it makes a statement on the exam that it won't run or won't hold, then you get to go over to this. But you can't exceed this, okay? All right? So anyway, just things to think about as you're studying for the code test. All right, this looks like the last one in this set. Says where a retail shopping mall, make sure it's still on the screen. Sorry, guys. Says where a retail shopping mall has multiple tenant spaces. Each occupant shall have access to the main disconnected means except A, where the service and, ma where the service and maintenance are provided by the building management. B, where there are more than six disconnection means provided. C, where the secondary of the service transformer does not exceed 240 volts to ground. D, where the primary feeder transformer does not exceed 600 volts. So what are we asking? We have a retail shop that has multiple tenants, like a strip mall type thing. Each occupants of it has, each occupant shall have access to the main disconnection means, but there is an application where they don't have to have main ac access to it, okay? What is it? A, B, C, or D? We'll end on that one for this part, and then we'll look at a, a couple in the uh, fast tracks, uh, the um, unit eight. Oh, let's see, Daniel says. Uh, 430. While y'all were looking this up, Daniel, 430.52 is dealing with short circuit ground fault protection. And that could be, you know, we're talking, uh, that's a, now, can you have an overcurrent device like a fuse that can serve both the short circuit and ground fault protection and the overload? Yes, there's certain provisions in the code for that. But specifically, 430.52 is specifically dealing with short circuit ground fault protection, really has nothing to do with overload protection at all. And, and remember, Jeff, with that one, the trigger was that it says that it was not less than 115. Even though, the even though in the code it says 115 or greater, when something says it's not less than 115, it means it's, it's at least 115 or greater. So that's what it would have kicked us in the 125. Now, if it had been 114, then you're absolutely right. It would have been 115. 115%. Absolutely. 
little nuances in an exam question. I mean, we used to say, oh, they're trying to trick us. Ah, they're not trying to, they're not trying to trick anybody, right? They're just, okay. Oh, is it is it because you have an apple? Is that what it is, Caleb? I, you know, I never looked. I, I have an Apple phone, but I don't. I, that's for work, and I don't ever. I don't do nothing. I hate Apple products. No disrespect. No disrespect to you, Apple lovers. But uh, um, and I'm surprised that the Apple doesn't have the join thing. That seems odd that it wouldn't have the the join feature uh, there. Seems odd, but maybe Apple's a hater. They don't. They don't like YouTube. Maybe. Um, okay. So let's look this answer up. So anybody got, let's see, I haven't, I think I have an answer. Uh, Gennaro, uh, are you answering this one? You said A. Okay. So where would we find, where would we find this, this requirement? Somebody, somebody help me out. Tell me where I would go to find this. Now it's, Tenants have to get you know the access to their over, you know their overcurrent device, uh, but this is their their main disconnection means. What do you think? And it's it's a nine eleven, so I'm even going to go on and answer this. Uh, absolutely, it is a. I want to get to the other thing because you saw that hourglass. This thing's going to stall out on me. So two forty dot twenty four b one one. Why that? Because we're talking about the main disconnection means. We weren't talking about any service. We're talking about the tenants having access to their disconnection means. Uh, so that would be in 240. Uh, not that 240 by itself deals with disconnecting means all by itself, but 240 is overcurrent protection. Uh, and in this case, the overcurrent protection is also serving as the disconnection means. Um, so if you look at 240.24, and you'll see that it says located on premise. So this looks like this is talking about, again, switches and circuit breakers, and it didn't make any, didn't say anything similar to that. But if you look at it, it says B occupancy. It says each occupancy have ready access, read it ready access to all overcurrent devices protecting the conductors supplying the occupancy unless otherwise permitted in 240.24 b1 and b2 then it takes you to number one and you'll notice that you go down the list and it says multi-occupancy builders it allows it to have electrical uh, electrical service and electrical maintenance are provided by the building management system okay for building management so that's where you get that another way that this would have triggered me is because I know that all conductors have to be protected by an overcurrent protected device. It may serve as the disconnection means, but since we're feeding okay, other tenant spaces, then it tells me we weren't talking about a service. We were talking about a multi-occupancy building, and we have the, they weren't services. We're talking about the overcurrent protected device that's going to protect the feeders that are running and they need access to their disconnection means. Okay. Unless again, it's under service, uh, service and maintenance. All right. So let's go on and jump out of this. Y'all did good with that tonight. Not too much trouble there. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so this is what you this is what you see. The, so this is the this is the challenge that our fast track students see. Oh, you know what? That isn't right. Bear with me. Bear with me, guys. I want to get rid of that because I want you to be able to see the whole thing. Hold on here, and I will do my best to blow this up for you guys real quick. And let's see here. Okay, I'll do this the best I can do it here. I'm doing this stuff on the fly, bro. 
And I'm going to move me way over here. Okay. So this is what our folks in the fast track see. This is their challenge. This is, this is their nightmare. Okay. They are um, given, hold on. Tim says 230.72C. Oh, hold on, Tim. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. What did you say? 72C? I want to look. Well, that's the service disconnection means. We didn't make any statement about service, although you probably would have still gotten your answer right. But we were talking about since the way it was written, it didn't mention any service, just the disconnection means. Subtle difference, but same application. Okay? You still would have gotten A, so there you go. Would have been fine. Ultimately, you would have gotten the right, same answer. Okay? But we didn't, we didn't say anything about services in that one, but it's okay. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, Caleb, I'm, not, I'm shocked that that would be an Apple thing. I would think if you use a standard browser, even your Apple phone, that you would be able to, to search, you know, if you had whatever browser you use, you'd be able to, it would be, I've never seen that. I would have thought that they wouldn't have anything to do because it's very browser driven. So, interesting. All right, so in these questions here, let me kind of, we'll move the code book here a little bit so I can work, look at some of these. Uh, one of the ones that tend to, let's say, I don't know, screw with people's head is number two. This one right here. Okay, so you might get, now these are the type of questions, right? No, Tim didn't nail it. No, hold on. He kind of nailed it because that was services, but we weren't talking about services. We we're talking about feeders, so we were under 240. But close enough. Close enough. Brian says you nailed it, so we're going to. But that really wasn't nailing it. And Tim knows because it didn't say services anywhere. But you have still got the answer right. You still got it right. Okay. All right. All right. So the next, so number two, let's check this out. So it says, um, let's see here. It goes, what is the lighting demand load before derating? Before derating for a house with the outside dimensions of 30 feet by 48 feet on the first floor and 22 feet by 42 feet on the second floor. Okay. What do you think? What do you think? Give me some numbers here. And you guys that have done the fast tracks, you've already done this one. So that's not going to be fair if you give the answer. Let's get somebody that's not in the fast tracks. Come on. Although I guess if you want to answer, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Remember, the key here, before any demand factors have been applied, we're looking for before anything, okay? We're not looking for the calculated load, man. We're looking for the demand load, all right? And you got to work it all out. Now, I do get quite a few students get this one wrong. So, but I think I want, what I want to point out for those that are new, that this is, a, this is what's called a competency, and this is inside of our Fast Tracks program. You can print these out. You answer these online. You just click and fill in the blanks online and submit it. But you can print these out and look them up and then come back and then fill in the blanks if you're in the program. Or you can do it live while you're on here. But you can always access the, the course with the book right here on the right to answer these questions. Say, so obviously, this is Unit 8. I could click the full book and then go right into unit eight and, and read it and get what I need to get. Okay. But what I want to know is what is the lighting demand factor here? Now, remember something, we're not applying anything else. Uh, 
close. Oh, very close. Very close. We're not applying anything else like uh, small appliances. We're not doing any of that stuff. Okay, we're not, we're not we're not adding any of that kind of crap together. Okay, so let's kind of we'll get our calci later. Try it again, O. Give it another shot. You're you're so close. All right, so. Okay, so what we want to do is we remember that in the code we're dealing with the dwelling unit, so. As you go through this program, you'll realize that, you know, again, it's dwelling units. It's three VA per square foot for your general lighting. It also happens to be for your general use receptacles as well. But your general lighting is three VA per square foot. It is based on 220.12 if you're obviously in the uh, 2017 edition. And it is based on the outside dimensions. Okay. And it doesn't include things like porches and areas that are not adaptable for future use, for example. Okay? So at the end, yeah, I figured you were there. You were close enough. I knew you, were, you, knew you had to be around there because I don't know where a 7104 would have come from, but you were close down. Now, here's something I do tell people all the time, and I, need to, I tell this to the Fast Tracks people as well. You always want to convert it down into VA, always. So when I do this, the end value is always going to be in VA. Always convert it down to VA. That's why we tell you in 220 that watts are synonymous with VA because we want you to work it all the way down into VAs. So for those that are in the fast tracks that get further on, I don't ding you early on that much. But as you get further along in there, if the question wants something, and wants to know the demand, ultimately we want it in VA. We, watts aren't going to do us any good. Okay. So you make sure that you, you work this out, okay? So we know it's 3A, so we're going to do each floor. Uh, and it's so much easier on the exam. They give you one floor. You're like, done. But there's two floors here, okay? So it's 30 by 48, and it is 1,440. You write that down. And then, of course, the other one is 22 times 42, which is 924. You write that down. You add the two together, boom, 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 and that gives you 2364, right? So there's 2364 times 3 VA per square foot. Where do you get that? Well, you're going to get that from the table 220.12, which if you're in the 2020 code, you're going to get that in 220.14J now in case you didn't notice that, right? Okay. But uh, what is it Tim says that ding? Dingled, I've been knocked out. <laughs> um, so there you go. So that's how you solve that one. And believe it or not, quite a few people uh, get, get that one wrong. Believe it or not. It's almost like they want to go and start adding demands and, and, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, the next one that people seem to, to have a little bit of trouble with, let's look at this one. Number five. So here's where you would put in the answer, right? If you're on the Fast Tracks program, you type it in. And of course, incidentally, when you're done, you just submit it right here. And then we will grade it and give you feedback. Okay. So here's the question number five. If you can see it on the screen, it says, what is the demand load for the service for two, for the service now, for two 3.50 kW wall-mounted ovens and one 5KW counter-mounted cooking unit. And remember, we're talking about the service. We're not talking about a branch circuit to this stuff. We're talking about a service. It says all the appliances are supplied from a single branch circuit. Okay, think about this for a second. A single branch circuit that is located in the same room of a one-family dwelling. Now, it's telling us a lot of information here. Okay, but what's important? What's important wasn't about the branch circuit. The important question is about the service. Okay? About the service. So where would you go in the code? Logically, we know where we would go in the code. We know we're going to be in 220.55, right? Is that right? Of course, I know I probably should let you guys, I should probably 
uh, let y'all solve this question because this is one that you might. Uh, Brian, did you see any like this? Uh, anything similar to this on the exam? Because you you might you might might not have. So I'll get my code book too and solve this mamma jamma. So get your code books. You know it's dealing with ranges, and that's something that people just study, study, study all the time for. So you should know 220.55 if you don't by now. Where you been? So go to 220.55. You probably have a tab for it. Pretty common tabs, you yeah, know, right there. Boom. All right. So now, what's something that I notice? Well, first thing off the bat, I'm not doing brand circuit load. So four's out of the question. So I don't have to worry about that one. Uh, I'm looking at my units. I've got two wall mounted ovens and I got one 5KW counter mounted cooking unit, right? So, yeah, th no, they're in there. They're in there, Ronald. You got to look in all the folders. There's a, there's a com the competencies are in there. There's just what we did for the 2020 is I've added more quizzes. So there's two more in two more small quizzes. And then there's there's a, the competencies are still in there. You haven't gotten far enough along. There isn't a competency in the first unit because the first unit's nothing really competency worthy. You, you got to get into the second unit. Then your competency stuff will start. But it, they're there. Um, you're not you're not far enough in it yet. Incidentally, Ronald is in the 2020 edition of the, the Fast Tracks program. Um, but yeah, you'll, don't worry. You're going to have your competency stuff. It'll be there for you. All right, so the first thing that I would notice here is that every one of these seem to fall where? Under column B. So if they all fall on the column B, which note do they apply to? Well, it says... Number three says where they're over one and three quarter through eight and three quarter, note three, right? In lieu of the method provided in column C, and this is the only time that we can't at least, you know, use column C. It's in lieu of column C. It says it shall be permitted to add the nameplate ratings of the household cooking appliances rated more than one and three quarter, but not more than eight and three quarter and multiply the sum by the demand factor specified in column A or Column B for a given number of appliances. Okay, so we're going to do that. That's what we're going to did. So what we did here is we've got three. They all fall under B. So we're still going to compare that to C, but I can promise you they're going to be less. So if you look at it, I've got three of them, and it says you go to the left. Hopefully you got your code books. You go down to three, and then you go over under column B, and it says 55%. Well, what's the first thing that I have to do? Well, I got I to gotta do some stuff here. I got to add some. I got to add them together, right? So I got to add 3.5 plus 3.5 plus 5. So that's 12. Once I've got 12, then it says apply the demand factor of the table. Okay, so you were almost there, O. So then you multiply that by 55%. So you do have to put your full value out there, okay? Uh, because we're going to do it. So it's it's 12,000, okay? 12,000 KW is what we had. When you add 3.5, 3.5, and 5, it's 12,000, okay? Add them up. It comes to 12. Do that times 55%, and that is 6.6. .6. Now, it's asking you the values, and, okay, don't be fooled on an exam where it says, uh, if it's if it happens to have six thousand six hundred, but the question asks you what the answer is in watts, uh, kilowatts, or VA, make sure you read the question and answer it exactly. Now this one's a multiple choice; it's easy. But as Tim and all of them will tell you, most of the questions in the in the competency exams are not A, B, C, or D. You're gonna have to give a value. In this case, the answer is D, six point six kW. Because they're all under the same one. Now, could I use column C? Absolutely. 
I could take three appliances and go to column C, and then that would be 14. I'm allowed to take the lesser of the two, so I am most certainly going to go with 6.6. .6. Ain't no way I'm going to go with 14. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to use the code when I can use it to my advantage. Okay? Okay? So there you go. So. There you go. And I will give you the code reference. Anytime I give you an answer in your fast tracks program, I will give you the question. I will give you now, if you score below 60, I will not give it to you because I'm a firm believer in our policy here at electrical code Academy is that if you get below 60, I want you to redo the unit, something in the reading, whether you read it and listened to it, something in there didn't click with you, right? Didn't click. So there you go. Now, the 2020 edition is a little more enhanced than, the, than, the, than this edition uh, because, again, we added two separate. We also had what's called, we added some drills, which are basically to throw you off balance. What they are is you do a competency, and then you come back and you do a drill. And if you score really low on the drill, you know, and it's only like six questions. So it's, it's a quiz, competency, drill. And so it's hammered home. So now the course has over 1,200. Now I guess it's, gosh, probably closer to maybe 1,400 code style questions on it now. Okay. <laughs> so there you go. And yeah, you answered C to eight. And some people did that eight thinking I treat it as one but we weren't doing it as when we're not talking brand circuit. We're actually talking lows, and these are three separate, three separate appliances. Okay. All right, let's see. What other one? Let's see here of the other ones people find difficult. I think this one here people also find difficult. See if you can solve that one. So you've got a 4.5 kVA, all right, and a K meaning 1,000, so it's... 4,500 VA, 240 volt clothes dryer contributes blank amperes to the neutral load. When calculating the service by the standard method, um, I'm not sure, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not 100% sure why this throws anybody, but sometimes it does. So give this one a look. Now, remember what we're asking for. We're asking for neutral load amps. We're not, we want to get, we, we, there's a value that we need. So there's some steps here. Maybe that's the reason why. There are some steps. So give this one a, give this one a shot. You kind of, now you guys that aren't in the program, um, we'll, we'll start seeing what, being what you have to do in the, in the fast tracks program and how you can, how you're going to learn because you literally have to work these things out. Okay. So what do you think? First things first, first things first, we're dealing with a clothes dryer, right? Incidentally, many people don't know that you're not required to have a clothes dryer in a dwelling. Okay. But if you do, you have to calculate it. If you don't, you don't just make one up. Remember, there's laundry circuits, small appliances, there's general, there ain't, and there's rain, you know, there's, it's talking about other things in there, uh, heat and air. It doesn't require you to have a dryer. You're required to have a laundry, but the dryer is not the laundry circuit, okay? But most all exams are going to have something, they're going to say something about a dryer or whatever, not, and we do too, so. So first thing that I want to do is I want to go look what it says about, uh, in 220, I want to look what it says about dryers. Now, here's something you'll notice that dryers are located under part three of 220. Part three is standard method, okay? Part four is optional. Optional, we take nameplates, okay? But under standards, we don't take nameplates. However, Anytime we're sizing a neutral, we're going to use 220.61. We're going to use the standard concept to do neutral sizing, okay? Even if we did the optional calculation and we took the, you know, the, the nameplate and that value and size an optional, when it comes to the neutral, 
we're always going to have to be utilizing the standard method for neutral sizing. Okay. Y'all know that. Oh, you've heard me say it a million times. Okay. So in this one here, it says closed dryers. Remember, we're under standard and it told us standard. It says dwelling units. It says the load for a household electric closed dryers in a dwelling unit shall be either 5,000 watts or VA uh, or the nameplate rating, whichever is larger. Hmm. So standard method, method should have triggered you to say that 4.5 means nothing to me because it has to be at least 5,000. That's the first thing you're thinking. 5,000. Okay. Because again, we're not talking nameplate for, we're not talking about anything for the optional. We're talking standard method. We already been kind of, we already been told that, right? Okay. So first thing that I'm going to do is I'm like, okay, well, I got to get my calculator out. If I know that it's 5,000 and I know that it's 240 volts, we're going to do a little ohms law, a little watts law, a little power table. Um, and so I'm going to do 5,000. One more time seeing my reading glasses here or my regular glasses, my bifocals. Okay. And that's 20.83, right? You with me? Okay. Well, remember when we go, those that are in the program, remember this, that when you're doing the calculation, you're doing the neutral for the service now. If you look in the code and you, and you look and you'll see that there is a 220.61 that says feeder and service neutral loads, okay? And then what you'll see is that it says permitted reduction. And that is B, and it says a service or feeder supplying a following load shall be permitted to have an additional demand factor of 70% applied to the amount in 220.61b1 or portion or the amount in 220.61b2 determined by the following base calculation. So in our case here, we're going to look, it says in the very first one, number one, it says the feeder, and I'm hopefully you're following along and I'm at 220.61b1, okay? It says a feeder or service supplying household electric ranges, wall-mounted ovens, counter-mounted cooking units, and clothes dryers or electric dryers, uh, where the maximum unbalanced load has been determined in accordance with table 220.55 for ranges and table 220.54 for dryers. So I can apply an additional allowance here, okay? So again, once we've done all of this, it's saying, okay, the general rule at the beginning of it said permitted reduction. And what am I trying to apply to this dryer? Neutral. It says, the service or feeder supplying the following load shall be permitted to have an additional demand factor of 70% applied to the amount in 220.61B1. So we read B1 and it says electric dryers are in there. So I can do this. So from my situation, I'm trying to get amps, right? So I have got 20.83 amps. That's what that pulls. Okay. Now, once I have that value, then I'm simply going to do this times 0 0.70, or if you want, times 70% if you've got that on your calculator. And so that gives me 14.58. There, right there. That is my actual neutral load. No rounding here. That is my actual load. The question wanted to know, what is the contributing amps to the neutral? That is the contributing amps. If I rounded it up, then I'm fictitiously amping it. Okay. It's wanting to know what the actual value is, and it's 14.58. So that is your answer, 14.58. You would put that in. Oops, sorry about that. You put that in right here, and you would put your code references over here. Okay. 220.54 and 220.61. It's your references. Now, most people just put one reference, but again, so fine, but we want you to learn where you, where you work and where you go with all this stuff. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see here. Which other ones do people have trouble with? Uh, I don't know that anybody has trouble with this one, but we're number nine. Uh, 
And I can't get it to highlight for nothing. There we go. Number nine. So this one says a one family dwelling has 175 ampere 240 volt service that is fed with 75 degrees C conductors. What is the minimum size copper grounding electrode conductor required? Okay. Now you'll notice something. It did not tell me the type of electrode. Okay. It just says it's a one family dwelling, 175 amperes, 240 volts. Okay. It, it's telling me, what else did it tell me? It's a service that's fed with the 75 degree C conductors. What is the minimum size copper grounding electrode, uh, grounding electrode conductor required? What do you think? So one family dwelling. Okay. So this one, you got to think a little bit. Let me give you some tips in case you're, you're wondering if you get a question like this. Okay. They are telling you enough information. You're saying, wait a minute, that doesn't give me the conductors. They're not telling me the sizes. Don't I size the grounding electroconductors based on the conductor sizes? Yeah. But they're giving you enough information to solve it. And I think that a majority of the people probably you know, get this one wrong because they, they don't figure work this out. Okay. We know it's a one family dwelling. We know that it's between 100 and 400 amperes. This is 175. We know that it is 240. And we know the conductors are 75 degrees C. Now, is there anything here that says, and again, we're trying to do always solve for the, the minimum size, what it's got to at least be. Is there anything that says we can't use 31015B7? B or in the 2020 code, it's 31012. But this is where you have that reduced size service conductors. Once we size these service conductors, then guess what we can do? We can size our grounding electroconductor. So we have to do, this is a classic example of an exam question. will make you do two steps. It's going to take you all the way this way in order to be able to figure out what the conductor sizes are to be able to answer it back this way. I find it a really good question, but you have to calculate it out, okay? So let's get this and see. Okay, first things first, we know that is, does this apply? The question is a yes or no question. Based on what you know here, does 31015B7 apply? Yes or no? And just so I can make sure that y'all ain't dead out there, I want to make sure. All right, Terrell's, all right, I know you're live because Terrell gave me an answer. Wait a minute, Terrell, aren't you in the fast tracks? You've probably seen this question already. <laughs> all right, so remember what it said? Remember what it said? It said that you had to, that when you can apply 83% of the rating of the service or feeder disconnection means. It's rating, okay? So that is in 31015B7. So I would look at this, and when it asks me for a minimum, and it's telling me, and I know right away when I'm looking at this question that I don't have enough information in this question to answer this question, then that should tell you on an exam you're going to have to calculate something, okay? So in this case here, I know that, 31015B7 does apply. And if you're in the 2020 code, it's 310.12. So I take the 175 and I do that times 83%. Oops, sorry about that. 175 times, I like to do 0.83, to be honest with you. It is 145.25. Okay, you see where we're at. Okay, now once I've got that, Okay, once I've got that, then I go to 31015B16, or if you're in the 2020 code, you go to 31016, and I want a conductor that's good enough for 145, at least 145 amps, okay? So I have to, of course, our value is over 145, but we want to keep an eye on the 145, just makes it easier for us to focus. And so I'm going to go, and hopefully you have your code book too. I'm going to go to 31015B16 because I am looking in the 17 code. Now, important those 75-degree terminals because i got to stay in that 
column. Nothing was said about adjustment or corrections. Nothing gave me any reason to be able to use the 90 value. I am stuck. So I'm going into 75 degree. And again, uh, copper is, unless you assume otherwise, copper. And I'm going down and I'm looking for 145. It looks like I'm gonna have a one ot. okay? Now, once I know the conductor, one ot, I don't need that for the example. I need that now to be able to go to where? You're right, 250.66. And when I go to 250.66, then, and now since it did not tell me any type of electrode, okay, that we're dealing with, then I can't use any of the allowances under 250.66 A, B, and C for rod, pipe, and plate, ring, or concrete. I just gotta go to the table. So when I go to the table, I'm dealing with one ot. So that would be a six copper. So the answer would be absolutely six. Beautiful question on an exam because, again, if I didn't tell you and you looked at this example, what would have triggered you to say, oh, I can use 310.15B7? You have to be able to look at it and say, okay, I get it. It falls within this perimeter and I can always use it, okay? Okay. Now, question I get asked from people, and I want to take you from the exam for a second. People say, do I have to use 31015B7 or 310.12? Absolutely not. You can size it full size if you want, whatever, and do everything, you know, whatever you want to do, it's fine, okay? You can size your conductors to the 175 amps, the same as the device, whatever. You can do it if it's, if it's what you want to do. But 31015B7 allows you to do this under base known conditions. And it's also that little mini table that disappeared. It's coming back in the 2020 in the code, right where it used to be. Um, and that's what it's based on, 83%, okay? All right. Uh, let's see here. Okay, um, next week I am going to do some of, oops, hold on. Next week, because I don't have time, it's a little late now, 9.47, and my wife is going to be yelling at me. We're going to, next week, we're going to work out some of these and uh, where we have the calculation, and we're going to work out these values based on what we're presented here. So that's going to be next week, which I plan on being Wednesday night. Uh, and so we'll actually work this one out, and we'll work this one out, and we'll work another one. I think, you know, uh, whatever Tim, there, there's one that Tim really likes, I guess the one that we had or what, uh, at the fax tracks guys, whatever they say, they think is the hardest one. We'll work that one out, but that's what we're going to, that's what we'll do next week. And that way I will, uh, show you how to work each little piece and every little component out on that. Okay. We'll do that next week. So now before I go, let me go back to the question. Um, uh, hold on here. So Ryan, you're still here. If you're still here, what is your solar question? And I'm going to come back. And all those that donate and everything to the stream and whatever, I, we appreciate you. Every donation helps. So I thank you uh, for all that. All right. Ryan, what's your solar question, my friend? Feel free to ask away. And while you're doing that, I'm going to look and see if we have anything on Facebook. I always forget to look over on Facebook. Nong. Nong, you did well. Uh, I don't know if that 14.6 amp one was right, Nong. That, uh, I think that's the one that was supposed to be 6.6. .6. Remember using column B. But looks like you were doing good over there. Hey, I just noticed Susan was in here. I would have mentioned Susan. I don't always follow the Facebook ones. Uh, I, I didn't see you, Susan. Susan, for those that don't know, uh, Susan's up in Tennessee. Sweetheart. Just a, an amazing inspector as well. And, uh, but she's... Um, um, uh, haven't seen her in quite a while because I haven't gotten around anymore and my company doesn't really let me go to the IAEI stuff anymore. So, but sharp lady right there. Definitely. 
and I didn't see her in there. I apologize, Susan. She's probably gone by now, but she's uh, sharp. Sharp. I like to say she's a sharp chick. It's no doubt. All right. So, Ryan, what's your question, my friend? Bring me that question on that PV. Bring it, bring it, bring it, bring it, bring it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Maybe you email me. Let me check. No, I see people trying to sell me stuff in my email. So, no, nope, that ain't going to work. Uh, make sure you subscribe. Make sure you share it with other people. Make sure you let other people know about our weekly show, our weekly thing. Make sure you don't forget about our Electrician Live on Saturday nights. Help make that thing special. Um, you know, it is, uh, we're, we, I en I'm enjoy doing it. Again, you can always send me questions during the week that you want me to pick up during the show. Just send me an email. And I'm more than happy. Um, I guess I could put my email in here. I will type it. It's info at there's my email address. And so there you go. It should be it should be in there. You can send me questions you want me to talk about during the one of our sessions, something that uh, confuses you or something that you have some confusion over or whatever. Um, you are more, uh, more than happy to email me and I'll discuss it during one of our weekly shows. And we'll break it down for you. But we'll break it down. Cooper, thank you for coming. So everybody, Daniel, Jeff, Sandra, everybody, Terrell, Tim, uh, Jay, everybody. Um, I guess Ryan might have stepped off. Hopefully I didn't upset you, Ryan, because um, I wanted to make sure I covered what I needed to cover. Uh, but I'm more than happy to answer your questions. If you want to email it to me, my email is right there in the chat, info at masterthenec.com. I try to answer as many questions as I can. I get hundreds of them a week, so I do my best to keep up with them. I, I try to answer every one of them personally. Uh, in our Fast Tracks course, I grade every exam. Nobody else here, Brittany doesn't, Zach doesn't, Jeff doesn't. I grade every one personally. So if I give you a feedback or I give you a little, hey, fella, you didn't do so good on this exam, you know, it's, I'm the one that grades it, okay? And interesting enough, in the 2020 edition of the Fast Tracks program, I even have more stuff to grade um, because we now have a new quiz that was added and that's not an automated. It's got to be graded by me, that type of thing. Uh, so again, it's a lot of work, a lot of interaction with me being involved in it, but I love it. I love trying to answer your, you know, help answer your questions and the materials, again, it's good material. It's, you know, there's, there's some people like it. Some people might not like it. It's a lot of reading. But you can use the audio feature and play it to you. There's, there's a lot involved in it. It's maybe not for everybody. But again, if you're studying just flipping through codebook, anything is better. And before you go spending money on some crash course, think about this. You can study in a Fast Tracks program. You can bring your questions to Wednesday night's training. How about that? And you're not paying for this. <laughs> so anyway... That's it for tonight, guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut it in tonight. It's, uh, it's uh, almost 10 o'clock here, and I've been going all day since 6 a.m., so I'm ready to cut it out. Uh, next week, we will go over some examples from the competency, and we will calculate them out. Um, I think we'll do unit eights, and I think we'll do unit maybe I'll, Tim or whatever. I think they remember that their tough one was maybe 14. I'll do whatever you know, we think the two, I think the two toughest ones are. And we'll work them out. And I'll show you how to work them out step by step by step. Okay? And then you'll get each piece. And you'll understand each little piece of it. It'd be awesome. All right. That is all I got tonight. I am about spent, folks. I think I am. I think I am anyway. So I appreciate you all. I don't know if you're all still on here because some of my core guys didn't respond. So I good. Okay. Uh, fast Tracks, you, you actually go to masterthenec.com and it's under courses and you'll see Fast Tracks. Or on the main page, you scroll down, you'll see Fast Tracks. And that's the, the exam prep. There's also a demo on there. Watch the demo 
when you go to the page and you'll get an idea of what the course is like, kind of an idea about it before you do any. Don't want you to buy anything that you're not comfortable with, definitely. Okay, but you did see the exam questions tonight, the competencies and, and things like that. So um, at any rate, that's what we got to appreciate all of you. Again, uh, thanks all of you that have donated or that have participated. Again, appreciate it. All of those that have purchased or are members of the Fast Tracks program, I appreciate you. Uh, all of you that come in here and watch our, our videos and, you know, I appreciate you. And those that share with other people, I appreciate you. I definitely do. And I'm hoping you're learning something from these. If there's something I'm not covering, just send me an email and say, Paul, can you talk more about this? Can you talk more about that? And I'm more than happy to do that. But if you don't lead me, I'm just kind of going all over the place with different examples each week that I can give you. So you got to lead me a little bit. So if there's something you want, send it to me and we'll discuss it. Okay. If you want to know how we actually size the nameplate for an HVAC system and you know, minimum circuit and passing maximum overcurrent protection or right, things like that. Let me know 440. I'll work you. I'll walk you through it and we'll explain it and that'll help you, but I'm here to help you. So I appreciate you all till next time, folks. Stay safe. God bless.